today. The meeting is open to the public and there are no items that contain exempt information. The meeting will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later through the Council's website. It could also be possible that Sheffield Live TV may record and rebroadcast this meeting. We've received no questions uh, from members of the public. Uh, please can I request that you turn your mobile phones onto silent and such other equipment so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There are no fire tests planned for today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from Town Hall staff and the assembly point is in Tudor Square. Uh, can I ask each member of the committee in turn to introduce themselves and we'll go from this side. Thank you. Hello, um, Councillor Rob Bannister. Thank you. Um, Ada Bushara, uh, Councillor for Netherledge in Cheryl. Uh, Councillor Mohammed Maru, Group spokes, Spokesperson for Education, Lib Dems, uh, Rear Park Ward. Councillor Anne Wishaker, Councillor for West Ecclesfield Ward. Councillor Rebecca Atkinson for Dawn Totley Ward. Uh, Councillor Toby Mullinson uh, from Hillsborough Ward. Um, I'd just like to pass on apologies for Councillor Haby, who will be late today. Thank you. I also have apologies from Councillor Talib Hussain. Thank you. Um, as said previously, there are no items uh, that are excluded or exempt, um, with exempt information, I beg your pardon. But could anyone, any members want to declare an interest on this item? No, nope. that's great. So item number four on the agenda would be public questions for which we have not received any. So we'll jump straight to item number five on the agenda is the Youth Justice Service Appropriate Adult Service paper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Amy Budry, I'm Head of Commissioning for Children and Families. Do you want to introduce me? Should I say Rachel? Rachel Wren, uh, Commissioning Officer for Youth Justice Services. Um, okay, so this item is in relation to the recommissioning of the appropriate adult service, which is a youth justice service commissioned service um, and part of our statutory duties within children's services. Um, we've previously been to committee back in September to seek authorisation to um, recommission this service um, and we went out to market um, in November um, and by the time we got to the new year we, um, we, we were aware that we didn't receive any bids for this service, hence why we need to go back out to market. Um, the, the work that's been undertaken since the new year and, and the current time um, has included a, 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 sort of a, a massive amount of market engagement and working with providers um, to understand the market and to understand their appetite for providing this service going forward. Um, and Rachel's led on, on a lot of that work. And what that has led us to is um, a remodelling of the, the service in response to what providers have told us um, and a, a remodelling of the financial envelope as well. So we are now in a position where we are confident that we um, will receive some bids when we go back out to market and we will be able to secure a provider. The reason that we've called um, this committee meeting in advance of um, the, the one set in September is that the current provider who had agreed to extend um, their contractual arrangements until we, we'd undertaken the commissioning um, have now alerted us to the fact that from the 1st of December they will no longer be able to um, continue with their extension uh, and therefore we need adequate time to make sure that we can go out and undertake the procurement exercise um, and we, we make sure therefore that we've got a safe transition from the current provider to the new provider. Um, two other things just to mention, one is that Sheffield is the lead commissioner across the South Yorkshire local authority for this service um, and also this service provides an appropriate adult provision for vulnerable adults as well. So there is an adult element uh, and financial contribution to this service. Thank you, Amy. Um, I've got a couple of questions. If anybody else has, uh, please let me know. Um, 
just on this then, you mentioned that there has been a relook at the offer and um, which has also then affected the finances. Could you inform members what is going to be different about this uh, procurement, this contract? What will be improved? What would, is, is, can you just explain what that will look like? Thank you. Okay, so um, from, from the engagement work that we've undertaken with providers, one of the key messages that has come back has been a lack of appetite to deliver a volunteer-based model, which is what we've had up to, up to the current time. Um, and that is, has been around um, the reliance on volunteers to be able to provide what, what is necessary. <clears throat> and therefore, that has increased the, the um, financial allocation that is required um, in order to be able to, to meet the demand and meet the need. Um, what that exercise has done, though, is provide an opportunity for us to unpick the finances and the service activity data over the last few years, which has evidenced that the majority, so 67% of service users over the last three years, have been vulnerable adults rather than children and young people. Um, and therefore, we've been able to um, agree a, um, a greater financial contribution towards this contract from adults, um, social care going forward. So um, this contract will, based on the assumptions that we're making from the market activity that we've undertaken, um, our assumption is that this will be, um, uh, children's services will pay um, a, a lower contribution towards this contract um, from the 1st of December. Is there anything you want to add in terms of the model? Um, there was a, a few things that the market engagement activity pointed out um, in relation to the service specification. They wanted it more in line with the um, National Appropriate Adult Network Guidelines. So I've made a few changes in relation to that in terms of our expectations around training and our expectations around uh, response time for call-outs. Thank you. One more question from me, and then I'll bring Councillor uh, Rowe in. Just on 4.1 and 4.11 and 4.12, is there going to be something in the uh, commissioning process around representation? Because it's, it says really clearly here that um, black and mixed heritage boys in the youth justice system are overrepresented, and will we be? Will there be a requirement that whoever provides this service? provides representation when sending them to support our young people so our young people see people like themselves in positions of support? I think that's a, a very good consideration. I'm just trying to think if we've been as specific as that in terms of um, the specification. What we can do is in the... Um, questions that we use to score the bids, we can in include the method statement questions, we can include something specifically in there about understanding the um, demographics and characteristics of the service users and um, we can ask providers how they will respond to that in terms of their delivery. That's great, thank you. Councillor uh, Rowe. Uh, thank you Chair, I think you've picked up on one of my questions uh, right at the beginning there. Um, I mean, first question I've got, uh, obviously, is that you, you, you've obviously followed the procurement process on this one, and it's going through procurement. Uh, and the area that I've actually picked up on is a couple of points. One is that you, you, you're talking about them being actual volunteers uh, that, uh, that come forward and, and do this work. Uh, the question is, how are these volunteers actually recruited, whether it's from a private firm or whether we choose to recruit them? But how, how, they, how they're actually recruited. That's, that's question number one. And I'll ask all the questions and then you, you, can, you can answer all of them. Secondly, as, we've, as, as uh, Councillor Dale has alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, 4.1, point 1, point 2 and point 3 uh, quite clearly states there that there, there is a, a disproportionality in terms of the need for uh, people that might have to engage with uh, people from uh, minority backgrounds. Um, and and you, you talk about the LAMI report, etc. Um, my question is in two parts here. One is, what are we as Sheffield doing to address this outside this framework? Which might be a wider question, Chair, but uh, it, it, it is a question because I think it's quite relevant that we've seen quite a lot in the press recently 
uh, of what's been happening and and it's becoming more and more uh, uh, more and more awareness around it and becoming much more high profile so the question is based around the fact that we should be ready for that sort of uh, position if we ever find ourselves in that position uh, and the second part of that question clearly is um, we can if we want to choose uh, under the procurement rules and you've already alluded to it uh, is put it as part of our specification and we can mark them higher if they do provide that service so I would suggest uh, via the chair that we, we, we ask we ask the officers to actually do that because it's addressing a point in time which is uh, a very relevant point at this stage and if we let this go through and then we have these problems a little bit later on then it's difficult to then rectify a contract um, and the third point, uh, just related to that, again, I didn't think of a third point, but I thought whilst I'm talking, is that we have a lot of, um, a lot of young people who have come here for, through asylum systems whose English is even poorer than some of the people that have been here for a, for a fair while. Is there, again, something that we can inco incorporate into the procurement process that that is uh, actually covered uh, as well? So that is pretty much all my questions, unless any arise out of the answers that you give me. Thank you, Chair. If Amy, you can respond to the procurement questions, and, and if Sally can respond to the what we're doing question. Thank yeah, you. okay. So um, in terms of what we can do through procurement and commissioning, you know, when we undertake any commission exercise, we undertake an equality impact assessment um, as part of that process. and regardless of, of what kind of provision or service we're commissioning, we would expect that any provider bidding would be able to provide evidence that, number one, they understand the cohort of people that they're delivering the service for, and number two, they can meet the needs of that cohort of people. So we, we would expect that as, as part of the process, uh, regardless. Um, in terms of volunteers, um, it would be the responsibility for the provider if they are if they are um, bidding to provide a volunteer based service or a service which includes the, the, the use of volunteers it would be their responsibility to recruit and support those volunteers and we would expect that they would have their own volunteer policy I think using this service as an example what the market engagement and insight has shown is that there's certainly in relation to this service a, a lack of an, an appetite um, for people to put themselves forward to, to support the, the delivery of such a programme which is why um, we've maybe had a, a, a reliance on it in the past that we can't assume we've got going forward hence why we've, we've had to um, make some changes to the service model. Thank you Amy. Sorry. Um, so just in terms of the um, disproportionate representation within the youth justice service um, and the question around that, um, we are working um, persistently within the youth justice service um, and within wider children's services around um, what we can do to support our children and young people. So an example of that would be around turnaround projects in Sheffield, which is the um, DfE funded project where we're looking at that earliest intervention um, that we possibly can um, and that, that diversionary um, from further escalations and I think looking at data for things like turnaround project we can see the, um, it, the large amount of success there I think there's only two young people since it's implemented that have um, then been um, known to youth justice service for further offences and that's about us being able to uh, work around the mentoring, the offering different alternatives and that engagement, what we can do about school inclusion, the, 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 the most, much bigger picture there. Um, so it is an ongoing piece of work through our communities, through um, children and family service and through early health um, about being able to work and work with our partners as well to try and address that um, disproportionality. Thanks, Sally. If I can ask, sorry, but if I can, yeah, I'm just going to say if we can ask for this to be actually on our work programme to be a presentation from offices across all departments to look at the overall picture about what we are doing in Sheffield, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for the answers. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by what you've just said to me. Um, just following up, uh, up on what you just said there, Amy, is that there, there are very few people who are volunteering for this sort of work. Uh, does, not, does that not in itself create a bit of a problem for us because it's the 
probably relying on the same people volunteering themselves, which means that it becomes a vicious circle that you can't really get any new people into it, uh, which starts to create some sort of, I'm, I'm just thinking out aloud, being devil's advocate here, saying it's the same people that turn up every time to do this, albeit very professionally, but you, you can probably see where I'm getting at here. Um, is there any program that we can influence in terms of, or, or put the message out there that we, we probably need more volunteers to come forward, in particular when you're talking about minority communities, uh, the chances of minority communities actually volunteering, and I might be completely out of context here, so apologies right at the beginning, is maybe that we don't get as many people volunteering. That seemed to be the sort of gist of what I've been hearing around education quite often, uh, but if this is not the case here, then as I said, I, I apologize for that, but it, it has the same repeat uh, that's, that's, that could potentially become a, a disadvantage to us uh, uh, moving forward. But it's just a minor observation. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that's a, a broader issue. It's a, it's a wider conversation about corporately what, what are we doing and what can we do to encourage more volunteers ac across the spectrum of services that we're providing. What, what the work we've done here has indicated is that that, that lack of appetite for this service specifically, um, hence why we've responded to that in the way that we have. But I think it is, it is indicative of a, a general reduction in volunteers and, and one which needs a, a broader response to other than what we're doing here with this service. Thank you. Uh, Amy, just, just on that then, uh, I've got Councillor Bashra and then uh, Councillor Mallinson. I'll just call you Toby now, I'm sorry. Um, when you've just said the, the, what we're doing to address it as part of this commission, you did mention it at the beginning. Can you just reiterate again what, what this commission will look like, which is different with regards to it being a, previously all being around volunteering? What makes this more? Yeah, so, so up to the current time, this service has, has been delivered with, a, with an element um, which is... Um, been provided by volunteers so there's been a reliance as part of the delivery that volunteers would would commit their time to going into the custody suites and and, um, and our police stations and supporting our young people and our vulnerable adults um, what this um, pre-commissioning activity has shown is that there is a lack of appetite for that and therefore we don't have the confidence or the reassurance that if we went back out to market with the same model that we would get um, the, the level of interest and, and the quality of interest that we need to be able to provide this service from December onwards. And therefore, the service model and the specification that sits behind that has been reviewed to reflect that, which means that there will be the incorporation of more paid workers and staff within that service, hence why the financial envelope has increased. Thank you. Councillor Bashra. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, it, it's been quite informative, um, especially currently with uh, some of the casework and things, what is happening out there. Uh, uh, such a service is uh, around. Uh, I'm just going to say, uh, being obviously, it's two years in being elected as councillor, before uh, that awareness out there obviously is limited on many services. Uh, going back on the service that you mentioned, you know, when you uh, point it out there for procurement, uh, I, I do um, relate and uh, hear we currently, you know, using the volunteers and where problems can occur, and which obviously you've picked up rightly. So sometimes, you know, the paid uh, makes a big difference. Definitely, uh, my question is in terms of uh, when when you're sharing that information and for projects or organisations to come forward, uh, if I'm understanding this right to apply for this, uh, to be able to then obviously run the project, um, and then having their own, because uh, there's many uh, organizations and projects out there who are doing uh, um, quite good with their volunteers, uh, picking people from lo local and, you know, making sure that they are up to the standard that they need and the skills and experience. Um, the biggest problem I find that we have is people not knowing uh, who probably are really doing some great work with uh, young people or have the skills and ability, but they don't get to know um, when these opportunities come uh, to be able to feed into that. Um, so it's uh, tapping into, you know, the, 
across all organisations. Sometimes they might not be directly working with the young people, but they do have elements, but they are doing some fantastic work, and that's across um, Sheffield. So it's just uh, how you're making sure that you are reaching out uh, far and wide, uh, rather than, um, like a colleague uh, Maruf mentioned, certain people who already know about it will apply, but the rest don't get to know it. And that's a common thing, just not just with this, but generally across anything. Thank you. I think that's where the, the pre-commissioning activity comes comes into play in the market engagement. And when we talk about market engagement, we don't just talk about a certain set of providers or potential suppliers. We talk about the voluntary sector. Um, we talk about um, providers um, that are operating within our communities. So um, it's really about um, making sure that we are, when we're undertaking that pre-commissioning activity, we are having those conversations and we are making sure that as many of those potential suppliers or providers um, are aware of it uh, as possible. Um, and also with our local area committees as well and working with our colleagues who are, are uh, you know, working across the city to make sure that they're, they're aware of, of what's happening within the commissioning space as well. I mean, in terms of um, when providers submit bids to, um, to, to win services to win contracts there is um, there is always an element of assessing social value within that and so um, across the board within commissioning any providers that can demonstrate that they are um, enriching their bid if you like with um, through supporting local communities or investing in local communities and working with volunteers and recruiting or providing apprenticeships for example that that will all add value to their bid and that's something that we would encourage. Councillor Mallinson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thanks for, for doing this in a timely way as well. Obviously, it's important that this gets done in, in the right manner. Um, I just um, wanted, to, uh, wanted to ask about the... Because I'm a bit confused about whether, whether you go out to tender and it's, you're looking for a professional service or whether you're looking for a service with managers, volunteers, or a mixture, or, or is it some sort of general tender which can cater for any of those? In, case, in that case, what, what, what are you anticipating will happen? Um, um, and my second question is um, just reflecting colleagues' um, concerns about diversity in terms of the the, the volunteers or the professionals, whoever they are, who have been the appropriate adults. Um, um, you know, that, that is a really important point, and we need to... Uh, I would ha I, I'd just be interested to know how deeply you look into the policies and procedures of the people you're, 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 you're asking to tender, the, the organisations, whether, you know, whether they um, incorporate diversity in, into their volunteers or professional... Um, Adults uh, um, and uh, whether, um, yeah, and, and basically how 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 those are, uh, how they can get, how, how they can ensure that, and maybe they maybe um, they have difficulties recruiting, and maybe they, it's a bit of a question about how open they are about that, and how hard they're trying to rectify the situation. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of the, the model that we are, we are looking for when we go out to market and the reliance on volunteers versus, versus not, um, as we've previously said, what, what we know is that we, we, we can't rely on a provider being able to provide a, a, um, a service that is um, predominantly provided and supported by our volunteers. Um, that doesn't mean to say that if we receive bids from providers that have got a volunteer element to it, that that isn't something that we want. We very much do and will encourage that. Um, and whether that be a, mi a mixed model between paid staff and volunteer staff or predominantly volunteer staff or predominantly paid staff, we, we don't know until we receive the bids what providers will put forward. But we are, we are basing our service specification on the information that, that we know and that we've, we've heard back from, from the market um, and to um, make sure that we've, we've got a service in place and to assure ourselves that we've got a service in place, we know that there has to be a, an element of paid staff within that. So 
it, it's open for the providers to put forward a model that they think will fit the requirements that we, we put out in the service specification. Um, and, and as I say, some may include volunteers, some might not, but we won't know until we receive those back. And do you look at the policies and procedures that... Yeah, so as part of any procurement exercise, when we receive the bids in, there's a, there's a, there's a preliminary stage, which is due diligence, um, which will go through looking at things like policies and procedures and financial infrastructure, um, uh, making sure that all the policies that we would expect are in place, because if we haven't got those in place, there's no point going on to the next phase of the procurement. And some of those include diversity policies. Yeah. Yeah. Also here. Yeah. Thank you. Firstly, apologies for coming in late. I had a community event and it ran over. Um, and thank you for presenting off because I wasn't here. But um, my question is around, if you look at page seven, where there was no direct provision in place to do a consultation. Um, and you say that people, well, young people are reluctant to discuss it. And then on the next page, you discuss how you assert child's views at the beginning, middle and end of each other. Well, we need to put it out there. Um, my thinking is young people in these kind of situations wouldn't want to speak to anybody, wouldn't want to cons you know, discuss their true feelings in case it will jeopardize whatever they have, um, um, how successful the program is for them. Um, my question is how well do, or do you put out, I've put here because you mentioned to Toby, which triggered me, is service specification. Do you put community organizations, do you ever speak to them, work with them um, in consultation? And the only reason I'm saying that is because when young people go back into their communities, those who actually deal with them front on are those community organisations. How much is that in the service specification you put out um, to these groups? And do you ever get a response on that? Is there a specific, you know, line that you put in there or anything like that? So we, we would expect any provider that is bidding to provide this service to be able to demonstrate that they understand our city and they understand the needs of the cohort and they understand the structures and the partnerships that are in place um, and that includes things like understanding um, organisations that are working across the voluntary sector and in the, in, within the community um, and that we would expect that they would have done their research and would be able to evidence that and it might be that they're, they're already working with some community organisations um, and they can use that as evidence in their in their bid as well but we would very much expect them to be able to also demonstrate the, um, the, the, the sort of the, the next steps in terms of the, the, the providing an appropriate adult service for, for our young people but then actually how are they helping them in terms of the transition on and working with other organisations to help that transition for young people. Thank you, um, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, just to follow on from that, I've worked on a lot of different community organisations um, and one thing I've noticed is if a community organisation wants to present as they understand, they can get the data, they can you know, discuss the data with you. If I knew nothing, I could simply search Google's demo, you know, Sheffield's demographic, how many young people, and I could present that as I understand. So my question is, how would you measure their understanding of situations? Is it experience or do you have a guideline to understand or is it based purely based on facts and figures? So, so within the procurement process, providers will, will be given a number of method statement questions which they will provide a response to and then an evaluation panel will score those um, and then we will have an outcome of that and um, a successful bidder. Um, then we would move into mobilisation, so that would be about making sure that we've got a transition from the current provider to the new provider and making sure that um, any risks within that have been identified and mitigated. And then post mobilisation we would move into implementation and that would include contract monitoring and support and that would be where commissioning would work with that provider on an ongoing basis to, to provide support and challenge, so that would be um, support to provide the, the best quality service that they can, but also challenge where we see performance dipping and they will be provided with a, um, a, a dashboard or, or a set of um, indicators and outcomes that we would expect them to report back to us on regularly. And if we, if we saw, for example, that any aspect of that was, was looking like it was going in the wrong direction or there was some underperformance or the service wasn't meeting the requirements of what we'd set out, then we would provide support to them to improve on that position through contract monitoring. Thank you. And this is going to be the last one before Dawn tells you. But um, just quickly, on page um, 
13, if you would, with over representation from people in the Bain community um, accessing these services. And then when Councillor Mohammed Maruf asked about volunteers and targeting those, and then Toby also asked about what represent, you know, is a statistically equal to the over representation of volunteers or those that you put out there in these communities that are over represented. One of the main issues that they discussed, and everyone's been in those rooms, is the over-representation and that we need to tackle it. And there's so many volunteers always in the room, but it's not translating into the data you're receiving. Have you gone out there and tried to see why the pipeline gets stuck in there, where there's actually volunteers who want to, but it never comes out the other end? Has there been any sort of you know, outward investigation into that that might actually boost up the volunteer numbers? In terms of barriers to volunteering, uh, I'm, I don't know, Rachel, was, was that, did that come out in the consultation with providers this time around volunteer models, or was it just a general lack of appetite? It was a general lack of appetite, generally. Um, yeah, no specific information came out yeah. of that. Is this lack of appetite from the people you're speaking to, to volunteer? From, from providers. Okay. Who, providers, who provide this service yeah. in, in other parts of the country. Yeah. Um, there's, there's been a general decline in the number of volunteers coming forward um, across the board. Sorry, so, can, I, can I just come in? Because I think the skewing things, I completely agree where you're coming from. But this is about just commissioning, the, the, uh, uh, commit, looking at the commission and whether or not we're going to agree to letting officers go out and commission this piece of work. I completely agree, having been on the Race Equality Commission and also working in the voluntary sector, I think there's a big piece of work to do around all communities and how we engage and remove barriers. And I think in that conversation, we can probably be having with Voluntary Action Sheffield, SADACA, other voluntary sector organisations about how we in the voluntary sector uh, can actually encourage people. I think this piece of work is about the provider being able to do that because we're not providing the service, we're commissioning the service. But I think it's really important that, as Councillor Marufa said, that we have some things in that commission that specifically say we would expect that you would, you know, encourage volunteers and workers from a specific community to be able to demonstrate that they are represented when they go to see a young person. They've got a young person in the room that they can identify with. So we had that conversation right at the very beginning, and I don't want to skew from the nuts and bolts of the volunteering, because that is, that is an issue across the city. And I think, you know, after COVID as well, people kind of stopped doing as much voluntary work. So I think people got volunteer fatigue through COVID as well, because people did a lot of volunteering throughout COVID and maybe decided that actually they needed a break. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I just don't want to skew the different topics, although they do interlink. Sorry, Malachi, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I think... We just need to look at what we're commissioning, what our expectations are for that commission, which are representation, which are good, which is good quality uh, of, of, of provision as well. And when we come to talking about youth voice, which is something I was going to ask about afterwards as well, because I'd picked up on uh, 3.1, there needs to be a really clear link between the youth justice service and whoever the provider is that we choose as the or we commission, because if they if, the, if I'm right, if an if a, um, appropriate adult goes to represent a young person, then that, if that young person then ends up in the youth justice system, the youth justice service, we can utilise their skills and ongoing relationships with young people to find out whether or not the service they received by their appropriate adult was appropriate for them. And then I think that there's going to have to be that in the commission I think that we are sharing information with the appropriate adult service so we know which children receive that service. And then it may be, because I don't know whether the appropriate adult service then have any further contact with that young person other than that visit in a police station to make sure that they're represented um, appropriately. Because then the legal system might kick in and then they'll probably get a solicitor or, or, or whoever. So I think, I think we can probably ensure if we can get that in as part of recommendation that we would like to see a, a provider do all of those things that I've just said and I'm sure Rachel's just written it all down okay thank you brilliant thank you thank and you. I, I agree it is important but the reason I also 
you know, I was emphasizing it is because there is a level of accountability in going out to commission in the first place before it gets to that. Or we might be in this room again next year saying, you know, we didn't actually tell anybody to do something. So they haven't. So Dawn's just explained that it is, you know, written and thank you to my council and Mahalo Mabuf. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Mollison, Councillor Whitaker, Councillor Atkinson, and then Councillor Bashra again. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. It's just a, a short question. Presumably at the moment there's a cohort of volunteers doing the, doing the work. I don't know how diverse they are or anything about them at all. Um, um, would the new provider be taking them on in a sort of cheeky style thing, you know? Uh, or, it, or, or would they sort of recruit entirely new ones or bring their own, non, uh, own appropriate adults in? Thank you. Thank you. So cheeky will apply for any staff which are on the current establishment paid staff. Um, any volunteers that are working currently in the service will be supported and encouraged to, to transition um, to, to work with the new provider as well as part of that handover. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, we talk about um, additional complexities of providing the service across multiple authorities. But then we're sort of saying through this procurement, uh, the council's hoping to reduce offending and re-offending. So how does, what does that look like? How does that work? You know. um, so it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the quality of the provider um, and, and exactly what, what Councillor Dell was saying about not just going into the police station and providing a, an intervention and then leaving. It's about the ongoing work with the youth justice service and support for that young person moving forward. And that's about the quality of provision that, that we're commissioning um, to um, for, for services that have got that interface and contact with that young person to, to work in the best way that they can to, to try and improve the outcomes for that young person going forward from that point in time. So that's with regard to re-offending, but what to reduce offending? So is that people who've never offended before to prevent, you know, what think, work's think, going on for that? Well, I think that's that's outside the scope of this commission. That's that's part of the, the, the broader youth justice service strategy and, and work plan, which is, is around prevention. Um, but this service that we're discussing today is, is specifically about those that have offended or alleged to have offended. Thank you, Miss Sally, did you want to come in again? Um, so one of the things just specifically in relation to this service and the um, prevention elements is some work that's ongoing with the Youth Justice Service and around the information engagement that they're doing with um, Custody Suite um, and that's providing information for officers, for the appropriate adults about what different diversionary services that they are about, who they can contact and really um, upskilling that information so that it's not simply an appropriate adult um, or a police officer that deals with the young person for that offence about being able to look at things more holistically. Um, so that's an ongoing piece of work that also links into a point that we made earlier um, about our voice and influence um, workers um, and about them providing additional scrutiny, scrutiny in terms of um, the Youth Justice Service and um, about um, accessing diversionary um, interventions um, as well. And so that's a commission piece of work that's due to be starting quite soon. And that's come on the back of the um, thematic audit that, that's referenced in the report, which is around um, the um, disparity in, in young people um, within um, all elements at Youth Justice Service. Thank you. Councillor Atkinson. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so, as I understand it, so you contacted 30 providers and I think you had significant engagement with four of them. I just wondered um, how confident you are that you will get bids from, you know, a, a number of the providers. Is there a risk that it will be a bit like last time um, this, you asked for, for bids and you didn't get any um, 
any responses, or are you more confident this time um, that you will be able to, you know, get, you know, get a bit of competition and bids from the providers? Okay, thank you. Um, I think it was ten providers that you spoke to, was it? Was it? It was, it was ten, ten that we've, we've spoken to, and four that have actually come forward with some um, uh, predicted costings. Um, which is what we're basing the financial envelope on going forward. So the, the, the two key reasons that we didn't, we, we believe we didn't receive any, any bids last time um, were about the volunteer base model and the, the financial envelope, both of which we've addressed um, and, and changed as part of this. So we do feel confident that on that basis we will, we will receive the interest that we need. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Bashrat. I think uh, one of my questions already answered. Um, just for my own clarification, so you know, with the uh, the new uh, tender that we see, you've just mentioned uh, the confidence uh, by having that paid element in, in it, which I feel just uh, com just as confident like yourself. Um, is that paid um, for the vo the volunteer that goes in uh, to support those uh, in the police or, or whatever? Uh, to avoid reoffending or reduce reoffending, the work that's done with that individual is the is it is the payment for the um, volunteers that take up on that, and before the volunteers weren't being paid. Is that am I understanding that right? Yeah, you're understanding that right. It would be paid workers that are delivering this model instead of um, a pool of volunteers. Okay. Yeah, um, that's brilliant. And uh, I think um, from the piece of work that you've mentioned um, in terms of um, the reoffending uh, system, so and just another clarification is once that piece of work is done with this one individual um, and if their time or sentence is finished and they are released back into the community, so does that support continue uh, or is it signposted to another service? Um, it, after that intervention is finished, just about that appropriate adult, that's about it being really important about people knowing what the other services are. Um, and so it's being able to um, provide interventions, whether that's through things like community youth services or supporting with early intervention work to our schools as well right through to some of the more specialist services from the Youth Justice Service. And I think it's just so important about us, that information being in, in custody suites and with appropriate adult service so everybody knows that there is um, a lot of different interventions and we can make sure we can get the right ones um, for children at the earliest point. Thank you, Sally. On that note, I think, again, I'm going to ask that in the summer, I think for members, because we've got some new, some new members and there's some of us who have been here for a minute, um, that we do look at this whole um, area for our young people so that we as members also understand what the pathway for young people, so where we're doing early intervention and prevention, what, what we're commissioning for, children, for young people or vulnerable adults that might end up in a sticky situation, and then what the follow-on process is for people. So I think just to be able to stick those jigsaw pieces together so that members understand, so that when we do come into this chamber to ask questions, we're actually asking questions about the appropriate part of the service because I think for sometimes it does feel like we're not really quite sure which bit we might be talking about because it's a vast offer. It's just not very clear to everyone what that offer looks like. Um, and if we don't know, it would be really very difficult for the parent of a young person to understand what that service would look like so that they could encourage their young person to access those services. So thank you everyone for that. So on that note then, um, I'm going to draw a line under the debate if I'm questioning if everybody's all right with that and come uh, to the recommendations. And so there, it is recommended that this Committee of Education, Children and Families approve the procurement of an external provider to deliver an appropriate adult service as part of a joint commission with Rotherham, Barnsley and Doncaster Youth Justice Service. The total value of the contract, including contributions from South Yorkshire local authorities, is £1.4 million. The estimated total cost to Sheffield City Council over four years is 798,000 as set out in this report. Do we all agree? Yep, that's agreed. Thank you. 
unanimously agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, just to let everybody know, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a lovely summer. Thank you for coming in. Uh, that The date of the next meeting is Tuesday, the 3rd of September at 2 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>